Hey guys, welcome back to Destin Reads Romance. I'm Destin and today I'm here with a wrap up for the last two weeks in October. And there's so many books to talk about. There are some really amazing ones that I have to gush over. There's some disappointing ones that I will vent over. And yeah, it's gonna be a good time. There's a couple books, um, so I need to start right now. And I'm gonna kick it off with one of the ones that I absolutely adored, which was There Are No Saints by Sophie Lark. <sighs> what do I say about this book? What do I say about this book? I am in love with this book. This is a dark romance, guys. If you don't like dark romance, you're not gonna like this one. So don't say I didn't warn you. This is about a serial killer. The hero is a serial killer, okay? This is not like a redemption romance. He just, he's a serial killer. And you just, if you don't like that, you're not gonna like this book. But it's such an interesting concept. I've read serial killer romances before. I feel like sometimes they don't interest me because it's a lot of like shock factor, focuses a lot on gore and stuff, which I don't really love to read about, but this works because it's about like the psyche of Cole, our hero, and how our heroine Mara gets entangled with him. The premise is that Cole is an artist. He's very famous in San Francisco, but he has a rivalry with this other fellow artist named Shaw, and they kind of compete, and one or the other always takes home like the grand prize of all these art shows and stuff. Both of them are serial killers, Cole and Shaw are. So there's a rivalry not only in their art on who's the best artist, but not who's the better killer per se, but Cole has more of like a refined feel to him, whereas Shaw has a little bit more of like a manic, unhinged, I can just kind of go bonkers at any moment type of feel to him. And part of the, part of this rivalry is that Cole has said he is the better, more clean killer. And Shaw has this thing where he wants Cole to kind of lose it, break free of his carefully controlled persona. And he's trying to tempt him into doing stuff that he normally doesn't do. One night at an art show when he sees Cole looking at this woman named Mara, which he doesn't know her at all. And he's just kind of looking at her. He's actually a little bit repulsed by her because she's dirty. Like he has a thing about cleanliness and she looks underfed, malnourished, and he just like, ew, that dis that disgusts me. <laughs> Cole's a piece of work, okay? Shaw takes this as, oh, you're obsessed with that woman. I bet you I can get her first or whatever. And Cole's just like, I'm not interested in her. You're, you're, to you're reading into this and no. Shaw decides that he's going to kidnap Mara and deliver Mara to Cole hopefully tempting Cole to do something drastic out of the norm. So Mara unwittingly becomes embroiled in this rivalry between two artists, two serial killers. And what really makes this book is Mara's character. She is such a strong heroine and the way that she responds to Cole and the situations that she's put into are just breathtaking. They're breathtaking. I admire her so much. She's such a badass. There's this one moment involving Mara going to this studio, which I'm being very vague, but if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. And I was just like, chef's kiss. Ugh, I love it so much. I love it so much. It's an unhealthy relationship. Absolutely, he's a serial killer, but it is one of the best dark romances that I've read. This is a duet, so it's continued. I think that Sophie Lark did a really good job of having an arc, a completed arc for this book, but there's absolutely room for more development between this rivalry in the second book. And I'm really excited. I have a few theories about how, where Sophie Lark is gonna go with the plot. And I just, I expect great things. I think that Sophie Lark is one of the most talented indie writers that I've read and I love her so much. So this was amazing, five-star romance. Then in a complete 180, Let's move to the other side of the spectrum from serial killer romances and go to historical romance. This book, again, like, <sighs> It's amazing. Also, can we gush over this cover? This cover. I want more covers on historical romances like this one. It's just, the embrace is breathtaking. The color is breathtaking. And it reminds me a lot of a um, Elizabeth Lowell step back, which is untamed. So I'm gonna put untamed right here, but it reminds me a lot of it because the embrace is very similar and they have like silk chics, but it's in pink. And I just, I'm, I'm living for it. I'm living for it. So anyway, I love this book so much. This is the second book in her Fifth Avenue Rebel series. I didn't much care for the first one. It had a very interesting friends to lovers plot, but the third act conflict really disappointed me. And I went into this arc very hesitant because I either really love Joanna Shoup's writing or it kind of falls flat for me. And I really wanted to love this one. Luckily, luckily it hit every checkbox that I wanted in 
this historical romance. Alice is this wallflower, but she has a mother who is extremely overbearing and she's horrible to Alice. Honestly, she tells her such horrible thing. She controls what she eats. She tells her the only way that she's going to get a man is an old man who doesn't mind her looks and her she's not smart and just she's very down on Alice. She's very controlling with who she hangs out with, where she is, and it's just annoying, okay? Alice wants to escape this situation. Her father's nice, but I mean, he's not around a lot and she knows that she needs to get married. She doesn't just want to marry anybody. She wants to marry somebody who could fall in love with her. So she decides while she's at this house party for her friend, it takes place during the same timeline as the first book. So they're still at the house party in the beginning. And she approaches Kit, who is a known rake. And she wants Kit to teach her how to seduce, how to flirt, because she's just like, I'm so awkward. Like, I just need help. I just need to know, like, how do I convey to a man that I'm interested in him? Like, how do I flirt with somebody? And how do I know that he likes me back? And when she approaches Kit, Kit in his room, he's like, whoa, what is this? This is like not the actions of a wallflower. So she does consider herself very timid, but she has such a bold streak, which is why I love Alice. She is capable of more than she thinks she is capable. And Kit sees that right away. He's like, this is intriguing. I would like to help this woman. At first he doesn't want to. He's like, I'm not the person that should be helping you with this. He also has his own baggage, his own self-esteem issues, but they do fall into this teacher-student relationship because she's like, teach me. And I love it. I love it. Also, Alice is a baker. She wants to be a chef. She actually is very close to the chef at the hotel that she and her mother stay at in New York. And he's been teaching her a lot of things. Um, her mom obviously doesn't want her to work in the kitchen at all. It's like not ladylike, but she does sneak away. And this is how she entices Kit into this exchange of skills because Kit is opening a supper club and he needs a chef. And he can entice the chef that she's really good friends with to come work for him. But Alice is like, I know his recipes and if you're willing to pay him for his recipes, I can actually write them down for you and that'll be my part of the bargain for this exchange of skills. And she's kind of hiding that she has actually cooked all these meals, like that's why she knows them by heart. And it's something that Kit discovers about her and starts to love about her. It's just oh, so swoony. It has the best romantic gesture. I would say it ties in so well to the book. I love their relationship. I love how this book ends and wraps up. It's just across the board, five stars is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Next, I read Moonstruck by Onley James. This is the third book in her Necessary Evil series. So we're continuing with the Mulvaney brothers who are serial killer romances. They were raised by Thomas Mulvaney, who is a psychiatrist, I believe, and he adopted these boys who were known sociopaths and psychopaths and decided to harness their innate urges to kill for good. And Atticus is an interesting hero. Atticus Mulvaney is one of the brothers that everyone likes to tease because he's very like stiff upper lip. He likes to be very neat. He doesn't like to get dirty and stuff like that. And they're just kind of really hard on Atticus. He is a doctor. The beginning of this book is Atticus going, just do the job. And what we find out is that Atticus doesn't even like killing very much. He's like, ah, it's messy. It's not my favorite thing to do, but it's a job. You know, my dad kind of trained me to do it. I feel bad if I don't do my part, all my brothers do their part. And when he's going to kill his target, he finds that there's somebody else there to kill the same target name and his name is Jericho. Jericho is part of this neighborhood watch. So he lives in a rough part of town and he and his younger brother and a bunch of other kids who really don't have great home lives, they like keep watch around their neighborhood and they get rid of bad people in the neighborhood. So they both have like similar agendas. And Jericho has only had one girlfriend in the past named Kendra, who the whole Mulvaney family absolutely hated because she was obviously um, a gold digger and just was after Atticus for his money. We find out Atticus didn't even like Kendra, but she pursued him and he just kind of gave in to her. What I love about this relationship is that it's a departure from previous books that we've read. The dynamic between the two heroes in this book is so different because Atticus is actually a submissive and Jericho is a, the dominant in this relationship and he recognizes that, oh, Atticus wants choices taken out of his hand. He wants somebody to take care of him. And I thought that was so freaking sweet. I ended up by really loving Atticus and I was very curious to see how Onley James would differentiate this book 
from the previous books because since this is this whole entire series about brothers who are all psychopaths or sociopaths and they're all serial killers, it runs the risk of getting too repetitive, but I think that Online James does a really good job of making each story unique and I absolutely loved it. There's one thing that I didn't very much like about the book. Well, two things. I didn't love the side plot. There's always like a mystery in each of these books. We're trying to find these bad guys and I hate to say it, but I wasn't as invested in finding out this whole ring of people who had something to do with the death of Jericho's sister, who recently turned up as dead. Um, I wasn't as invested in that side story as I was with what was happening in Unhinged and Psycho. Those were a little bit more compelling, but there's one thing and it's a complete spoiler. So if you've not read Moonstruck and you don't wanna be spoiled, don't listen to this next part. I really disliked how heavy handed Onley James was with telegraphing that Aiden, one of the adopted brothers who is never there, we know that there's something going down with Aiden and Thomas, the adopted father. He had always made comments or the brothers had said, he'd always made comments like, you know, that's y'all dad. That's not my dad. Like I don't consider him my dad. And he just, he never, he never is at the house. We find out in this book that Aiden is petitioning to have his adoption dissolve. Like he's a grown man. They're in like their late twenties and stuff. And he's petitioning to have his adoption dissolve. And immediately Noah and Lucas, who are the non-sociopathic people in this family who kind of married into it, are like, oh yeah, what if Aiden wants to bang Thomas and Thomas wants to bang Aiden and Thomas is struggling with it. <laughs> and it's not that this has not been telegraphed because this is one of the things that my friends and I were discussing that we feel like there's going to be a romance between Aiden and Thomas. It's gonna be a little bit taboo because of the adopted thing. And since he's dissolving his adoption, it'll be less taboo. He was also adopted whenever he was 17 years old, like he wasn't a child. But I feel like Onley James is very heavy handed with this explanation and it was a lot of telling not showing we didn't see the tension between Aiden and Thomas we've only heard about it and I didn't love the way that it was basically a family meeting talking about this and I'm wondering if Anneli James feel like she had to put that in there for people who would not like this type of dynamic think it would be too taboo I'm not sure I am part of her Facebook group and I've seen a lot of people like very excited about the Aiden and Thomas pairing like hoping for it wishing for it and I'm sure that there were some people that had negative things to say about that so I don't know if that had a role in why she decided to go in with a sledgehammer to beat me over the head with there's gonna be a romance between Aiden and Thomas, like I could figure that out for myself through context clues and I would have rather seen the interaction between Aiden and Thomas and felt that tension rather than have a family meeting being like, Thomas is, you know, he's he's drinking, he's heavy drinking and there's something going on and, and Lucas and Noah being like, I think I know what it is. It would just felt very out of place and very weird. And I didn't love it, so. Anyway, those are the things that kind of brought this book down for me. And the reason why I gave it four stars, and it's not because of the romance between Jericho and Atticus, I think it was phenomenal and I loved it. Their romance was the highlight of the book, but just the side plot wasn't as interesting. And that thing that I didn't like, it brought it down to a four star, but it's still a fantastic book. Like I still loved it, but just compared to the others, wasn't my top favorite overall book. Next, I read The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. Now, this was an idea, I had an idea that I was going to read books that I said that I was never going to read for a vlog, and I actually didn't have time to do that vlog. And the only book that I read on that list was The Love Hypothesis. So I'm gonna table that vlog with the other books that I wanted to read, which includes um, It Happened One Summer by Tessa Bailey, The Naked Fisherman by <sighs> Jewel E. Ann, Another one that I can't remember and also The Redemption by Nikki Sloan. Those books, I, yeah, those are gonna be on a vlog sometime, somewhere. It might not even be until next year, who knows? <laughs> but I did have time to read The Love Hypothesis. The major appeal of this book is that it's Raylo fanfic. I am a huge Star Wars nerd. I was very excited about the potential romance between uh, Kylo Ren and Rey. I was one of those people that um, I have all kind of fan art saved on a Pinterest board of Rey and Kylo living happily ever after. So I was very excited <laughs> that this book was based on Kylo and Rey. And like, they look like them. Like this, this is Adam Driver as Kylo Ren. This is Rey, she even has a little bun. 
come on it's just perfect anyway this book is also has female representation in stem which is really cool olive is going for her phd and the hero adam not Adam Driver, I forgot what his last name is in the book, but Adam, he is a professor and a doctor and he has this reputation of being a hard ass. Like nobody wants him as an advisor because he like shoots all their proposals down, whatever. I'm not like up to date on the lingo with everything that's involved in higher education with that stage of life. Anyway, Olive kind of has what I would call like imposter syndrome. So she is trying to get her PhD, but sometimes she has self doubt, like is what she's trying to accomplish not good enough because she knows it's good enough. It's a very personal reason for her, but does she belong? Does she belong with all of these other people who are PhD candidates? And it's harder for women in the science field to be taken seriously and stuff. So she has a little bit of imposter syndrome, but she's such a sun sunshine uh, character and Adam is such a grump character. This is also a fake dating trope. The way that it kicks off is a little bit weird, I will say. Um, but Olive accidentally kisses Adam because she's trying to prove to her best friend that she has moved on from her previous, not even boyfriend, because she went out on one date with this other dude. She knows that her best friend is interested in him as well, so she's like, I'm gonna show my best friend that I have moved on. And from very tenuous circumstances, the way that it was all contrived, she ends up by kissing Adam, the notorious professor, and then she has to pretend to fake date him. And the way that Allie chooses to make this a mutually beneficial thing is that Adam needs to prove to his department heads who have frozen all of his money that he's trying to conduct his research with, um, he has to prove that he is not like a flight risk, that he's not going to suddenly switch schools go to a different program and stuff to do his research there he has to set down roots and so he's bought a house recently and if it was known that he had a girlfriend who was local maybe they would like back off and let him have his money to continue doing his research so it's mutually beneficial to have a fake dating scenario I loved Adam's character so freaking much so much he's such a grump but you can tell how much he cares about Olive and Olive is a little bit oblivious about that but I really just I thought it was really cute I did have a couple gripes about it so this is going to be slight spoilers about the things that I'm going to talk about like I said I was trying to convince her best friend that she's moved on and when she's pretending to fake date Adam her best friend's like oh that's your boyfriend over there like why don't you go give him a kiss and stuff I was convinced that her best friend knew that Olive was faking it but also saw that there was chemistry between them and was kind of like pushing it to see how far it would go like she was telling Olive to do a lot of things that were PDA related in a bunch of different scenarios and I was convinced that the friend knew and she was just pushing Olive's buttons to see if she would actually go kiss this guy that she's fake dating and not really dating in real life. That's not what happened. She just didn't know. She was just nonchalantly encouraging her friend to just, I don't know, be put in very awkward situations that I personally wouldn't want to be put in. I'd be like, shut up. No, I'm not going to do it. But Olive felt like she had to do it to prove to her friend that this was a real relationship. Anyway, I like some scenarios that end up by happening. Like, they were in an auditorium listening to this speech and there was like no sitting room and her friend was like why don't you sit on your boyfriend's lap and that was like one of my favorite scenes so there were some really good things that came out of that but i just thought that the friend knew and looking back in hindsight knowing that she didn't know i felt like her actions were a little bit weird and then another spoiler for the end of the book i didn't love how thomas just came mustache twirly villain out of there at the end. I know that this really does happen in real life and he was a predator and, and he was only interested in Olive because he wanted to get in her pants and stuff like that and apparently had a grudge against Adam who was so say his best friend and stuff and it just, I felt like it could have been sprinkled in a little bit more subtly. The only hint that we get that Thomas is a bad guy is that Adam's other best friend Holden does not like Thomas and I thought it was because maybe they would have like an enemy to leverage relationship Thomas and Holden no so anyway I just felt like it was a little bit ham-fisted you know at the end mm. so it wasn't my favorite but it was still an enjoyable read so I gave this book four stars next I this might be surprising to some people but I finally read Brutal Prince <laughs> 
This is one of the books that I actually, this is the first book by Sophie Lark I picked up and I didn't love Ada and Callum's enemies relationship. And Jen just told me, okay, if you don't like that, then stop and just go to the next book because you'll love Stolen Air. And that's what I did. I stopped reading Ada and Callum's book because I was just like, I hate them. She's annoying. And I read Stolen Air, loved it, completely binged the rest of the series and it was amazing. I love Sophie Lark. So I decided to go back to the beginning and give Brutal Prince a try. Jen also suggested that the audiobook was really amazing and the way that the narrators told the story, it made it very humorous, like the antics between Ada and Callum since they were enemies in this marriage of convenience situation. And it was great. It was great. I do love it. I do think that Sophie Lark has gotten a lot better in her writing. So as much as I did enjoy Ada and Callum, I think that compared to like the rest of her book, she has written better stories. So I did love them, but I gave it four stars. Next, this is a book that I have to vent about. Um, Archangel's Light. I was looking forward to this so much. Um, and it bombed for me. It really did. And I hate saying that because Nalini Singh is one of the authors that I absolutely adore. I love her Size Changeling series. I've been invested in the Guild Hunter series. This is book 14. And I will say that the overall story and plotline for the Guild Hunter series as a whole has really stagnated. Like, I feel like she needs to start wrapping up this world. If she still wants to continue writing in it, there needs to be some sort of spinoff, some separation, some time jumps or something to breathe new life into the series but I was really excited about Archangel's Light and I love this cover so much because this couple has been teased in the background they've been knowing each other for 500 years have been best friends for 500 years and there's been very subtle hints throughout the series that they might want to take their relationship from platonic to actually romantic and even though the Guild Hunter series doesn't have a lot of romantic elements in it there is still romance in the Guild Hunter series. If you go back to Angel's Blood, the very first book, Raphael and Elena have sexual tension throughout the book. It might not be the most explicit of sex scenes, but there is a sex scene in there. And you definitely feel like these two people are attracted to each other and are falling for each other in the first book. The last couple of books that I read in the series, the couples just kind of end up together as like almost a convenience by the end of the book. It's just like, oh, we hung around each other for the entire books. I guess we should be in a relationship now. There is no sexual tension, no romantic tension between uh, Ilium, Bluebell, my favorite angel, and Aiden or Adon or whatever. It, it's very like Gaelic and stuff. Anyway, I was extremely disappointed. Half this book is flashbacks. I don't particularly love flashbacks. Sometimes I could feel like filler, and since every other chapter was a flashback, it did feel like filler. There was no new information, even though the flashbacks were cute because it was showing Ilium and Adon as young baby angels. Um, forming a friendship, it's not new information. We knew that they were the best of friends joined at the hip since they were young. We knew that Adon was an apprentice of Shireen, who's Ilium's mother. She's a famous painter throughout Angel Kind. We knew all of that. And as much as it was adorable, it was no new information. We didn't get depth of relationship that we didn't already know was between these two from the previous books by just witnessing them together in the present day and knowing how much it tore at Ilium when whatever Adon had experienced. He has a tr past trauma that like really affected him very greatly. He doesn't like to be touched. We knew how much that hurt Ilium because he couldn't help his friend through that time. And it just, nothing worked for me. Nothing worked for me in this book. The plot in China could have been wrapped up in like two chapters and I think that that's why there were so many flashbacks because there wasn't really a substance for the reason why Ilium was there helping um, Su Yin out. Mm, no. And then like I said there's no sexual tension between Aiden and Ilium and like we get like one kiss at the very end and I'm like what is the shit? I'm pissed at it but I also love Nalini Singh. I want to give it lower but it's a three star for me. It's technically lower, but this is kind of like author bias. I love her so much that I'm going to give her a higher rating than I think the book deserves. But it's, uh, uh, no. I felt this way about the last book as well. And there hasn't been an interesting storyline since Archangel's Heart, which was book nine or 10, nine? I think it was book nine 
when the whole Luminata plot that I was like oh she's taking it in a new and fresh direction this is really cool and the rest of the plots after that just kind of like boring 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 this might be the last book in the series that I ever read because I'm that pissed about it anyway okay the next book that I have on my list is The Kiss of Death by Erin Hadley this was part of my October TBR I really loved this cover also really love that it was like a um like a demon romance it's called the Demon's Muse series this is the first book we meet the heroine and the first chapter was so good. Sienna is at this convenience store. She's an artist. She's just made um, commission on this piece and she is very down on her luck, doesn't have a lot of money, but this is gonna set her up and she's very excited about this. She's even splurging on this coffee <laughs> at this gas station, like a frozen frappe whatever thingy from Starbucks at this convenience store. And she knows the cashier very well she calls him by name when she's checking out this guy walks in and holds him at gunpoint because he wants the money from behind the counter and when the cashier is like i can only access certain amount of money in the safe you have to wait 10 more minutes before it'll let me get any any more the robber decides he doesn't like that answer and shoots the cashier and sienna is so horrified and she gets hit over the head with the butt of the gun and time kind of starts moving slowly well, there's this angel of death that appears and she begs the angel of death, like, don't let the cashier die. He has a family. He has a son. Like, I will exchange my life for his. And the angel of death is like, well, I need you to give me something in return if I'm going to save him. She's like, well, what more do you want? I'm, I, you can take my soul, <laughs> like, for his. And he says a kiss. So she kisses death. And then she wakes up in the hospital. She finds out that the cashier is in surgery, expected to survive, and she's gonna be okay as well. Years later, she starts college. It's two years later. She's been saving up money and she's finally starting college. She wants to get an art degree. That's where the story starts falling apart because it starts feeling like this very crappy college romance. There's a plethora of hot guys that appear and stare at her. And it's just, it was just so mediocre. For such an awesome beginning, this kiss of death, her being saved, having this connection with death, and then going to this college setting where there's so many beautiful men, they're so uniquely beautiful, some have like pink fluorescent hair, the other one is like an artist. Uh, no, it just was not working for me and I DNF'd it pretty quickly. And then I found out that this was a reverse harem romance, which is not why I picked it up at all. I just thought that you know, a demon and human romance would be really cool. And I read spoilers for the rest of the series and I was like, oh, this is a reverse harem. That's why there were so many hot men roaming around. This is not just a romance between Sienna and Death. It's with a lot of characters. Yeah, anyway, I just did not love the way that that was playing out. So yeah, I'm glad I DNF'd that one. Then I read Ensnared by Tiffany Roberts and this is the first book in the Spider's Mate trilogy, I believe. So I don't know how to say this name. I'm going to try my best. The hero, the spider, is named Catan, and the heroine is Ivy. And Catan is the spider who is kind of a loner. He likes to be in like the woods collecting things. And the queen of their, I don't know what you call like a spider group of spiders. Anyway, there's a queen and she really wants Catan for her mate. And he's like, no. I can't forgive you for the way that you treat our people. Like she's very ruthless and brutal and there's hints at like some past like transgression that the queen has done, possibly involving his family. And the queen is determined that Catan is going to be her next mate. Because he's so defiant, like that's very attractive to her. Well, he goes back into the woods after he pays his tribute to the queen, tells her no again, and he suddenly discovers this place with these weird creatures and it's humans who are in like a cryogenic sleep and they have crash landed on this planet i don't know how long they've been there but it's been a while they were supposed to be on their destination was a completely different planet and her pod ends up by opening up and he rescues her takes her to his nest and there's a communication barrier and it's just so unique and so different i didn't expect to love it as much as i did but i truly did i think that their relationship is developing at a good pace um, and it is a trilogy, so the next book is going to continue with their romance, and I'm really excited to see what happens because that queen has got it coming, okay? I can't wait until she gets her own because I hate her so much. 
I just really liked it. So I gave this book four stars. Then I read another kind of alien romance, Viper. It's a snake romance. It's the first book in the Naga Bride series. These Naga, they actually inhabit Earth, but something happened because Earth was invaded by these aliens who pose as like allies and friends, gave them some technology, but then they kind of like turned on them and stuff. So Earth has been uninhabitable for a long time. And humans are at war with the same people, like the lurkers or whatever. They need weapons. And so they decide to go back to Earth because they think that that original alien race had left those weapons on Earth. So whenever they get there, <laughs> It's inhabited by these Naga, and these Naga are like, okay, we'll give you the technology that um, are he that's here, but we want your women. So there's three women on that um, spaceship. Our hero, Vrushka, immediately sees Gemma and is like, oh my god, I have to have her. He's like a red um, pit viper, and she has like long red hair, and he's like, oh, she even looks like me. Like, yes, I want her. So it's like a captor captive romance. And Gemma like absolutely does not want to be captured. And I really did enjoy this. It's a little bit weird. I feel like the world could have been set up just a little bit better, but I did enjoy it. So I gave it 3.5 stars and I liked it enough to go to the next book, King Cobra. King Cobra, I definitely felt more invested in this couple. Daisy and Zaku. Zaku actually, his home is a lot more sophisticated than Vrushka's was. Vrushka was like a tunnel in like the dirt. And uh, Zaku actually has a very high tech home and like robots even like repair everything. And he kept, he keeps Daisy captured. And Daisy seemed like very frail when we first meet her in Viper, but she actually is pretty resourceful and I really liked her. And I liked their romance. I liked it a little bit better than Viper. So I gave it that book five stars. I meant four stars, not five stars. Yeah, they're weird snake alien romances, but I like them. They're half snake, half human. Then I read Dangerous uh, by Minerva Spencer. And I don't wanna say too much about this because we are reviewing this entire book on the podcast. And it was just such an enjoyable, very interesting, super different than any other historical romance that I have read. And it's mostly to do with the heroine's um, backstory. She was 14 whenever her ship was captured by the Corsairs and they sold her to this like Sultan. And so she's been part of his harem since she was 14 years old. She's recently escaped and come back to London. It's been, how, how long was she there for 14 years, 15 years, somewhere around that. And her father just kind of like doesn't know what to do with her. He's a little bit embarrassed. She is not well versed in like <laughs> the do's and don'ts of London society since she hasn't been a part of it in so long. And he just kind of like wants to hand her off to the highest bidder. Like any old dude will do, but there's this guy named Adam de Courtney and he has reputation because two of his wives have passed away under suspicious kind of circumstances maybe. So he's also a contender. And I love the heroine because she's just like, I think I can work with him. And she has her own agenda that she just like, I'm gonna get married, but like I have other plans and I'm going to use him to my advantage. She's also very comfortable in her own skin. She's very comfortable with nudity. She's been in a harem with a bunch of women who like barely wore clothes and everything. So she, I, I love that she's so comfortable in her own body. It's just a very different departure and I really loved it. I really love this book so much. So I can't wait to talk about it on the podcast, five stars. I moved on to the next book in the series, Barbarous, which I'm still waiting on my copy, Amazon. Barbarous, I love these covers by the way. I don't know if I showed, hold on. Like this cover, this cover is ridiculous. I love it. And then Barbarous is also just amazing. You meet the hero of Barbarous, um, Ramsey. <laughs> He has a reputation. He uh, has lost one eye and he has some connections to our heroine from the first book. He was actually thought to be dead or missing for, you know, decades. He is the, or was the next in line to this earldom, but his uncle had remarried. So he was really old. His uncle was pretty old and he decided to marry this young girl named Daphne. And we find out that Daphne was actually pregnant before she married him. And it was kind of a good deed why Thomas, I think his name was. I think the reason why Thomas married Daphne is to give her a safe space because she was pregnant and he needed some heirs. So she has twin boys 
And Daphne is so, she feels so awful now that Ramsay has come back because she knows that she's robbed him of his birthright, knows that he is the rightful Earl, but she also doesn't want to harm her son's future, but she knows she feels so wrong. So I have to come clean eventually. I just don't know how to do it in a way that protects my son and myself from scandal. <laughs> and then he also finds her very attractive and so does she. And he calls her auntie in a very teasing way. Like she's younger than him. And I just love the romance that developed between them. I thought it was really fun. It wasn't as like adventurous as dangerous. So I gave it 4.5 stars, but it was a very enjoyable read. Another very different read. Also the timeline is very crossed with Dangerous and Barbarous because a lot of the events actually happen before Dangerous. And then we get to see our couple in Dangerous kind of interacting and scenes that we've already seen play out in Dangerous. Yeah, anyway, it was a little bit confusing, but or a little bit weird. I still loved it though. Okay. Next, I reread The Year We Fell Down by Serena Bowen. I love this book. The heroine, Corey Callahan, she has uh, suffered a spinal cord injury. And I won't go into detail of like wh how she did because it is slowly revealed how that happened. It's part of her story to tell. And um, she desperately wants to continue with her life. She wants to go to college because her parents have been a little bit overbearing and she's just like, I just need my space. So she has to have a handicapped room I love that her roommate is amazing. Like she didn't even know this girl, she just got paired with her and her roommate is absolutely amazing. I love good girl relationships, friendships in college. Like I don't need all the girls to be mean girls. Like, no, I don't want that. Her neighbor, Adam Hartley, is very hot and he is a hockey player and he's fractured or broken his leg in a couple different places. So he also needs a handicap room, handicap accessible room because he's on crutches. They form a friendship. So this is a true friends to lovers relationship and Adam actually has a girlfriend at the beginning of this book and I love the tension that is built between Corey and Adam I think it was phenomenal so good I love this it's one of my favorite friends to lovers romances and I hadn't read it in a while and I need a little pick-me-up so five stars for that then I read Nobody's Hero by Beck McMaster this is the first book in her Burn Land series very Mad Max vibes but with kind of zombie creatures called revenants and wargs, which are werewolves, but these are werewolves that are mindless creatures. They just wanna kill, hunt women because they feel the need to breed and it's not consensual. So our heroine, who is a woman living in one of these like last stronghold communities in the wastelands, she gets captured by a warg and she's kind of confused as how this guy can hold back the change because wards wargs almost have this involuntary response to the moon that they have to change into their wolfish form but he doesn't and i love this romance so much it's so cool we're reviewing this one on the podcast and i went on to the next book in the series the last year hero which i'm not going to talk about the hero of that one because it's kind of a spoiler but it's another kind of like adventure Mad Max plot, and I love that one as well. I gave it 4.5 stars. Then I reread Mind to Possess by Nalini Singh earlier, because I was like so excited about Archangel's Light. <laughs> Bummer. So I decided to reread Mind to Possess. I've already read this book a ton of times, and it's been a while since I've read Clay and Tally. I love this. It's a friends to lovers romance. Can you tell I like friends to lovers romances? It's a friends to lovers romance where Clay and Tally both grew up in a rough neighborhood. Talon was actually with a foster family who abused her. Clay killed her foster father and was sent to juvie and she was put in another foster family. Her case was very high profile because it was discovered that her foster family had been killing their foster children for decades and stuff. Anyway, well, Clay thought that Tally was dead these past couple of decades and she shows back up. So she has a lot of PTSD from that time and was part of the reason why she decided to kind of fake her own death where Clay was concerned. But she needs help now because she has been a counselor for this Shine Foundation where it helps kids who are in foster programs and stuff like that um, try to make their life better. And some of her kids have been disappearing and recently a couple of them have shown up dead. Since Clay is part of Dark River, he's very powerful in the changeling community and she's like i know that i can i know that they'll help me and that's how they reconnect i love their romance so much mm, it's delicious i also reread unraveling him by claire kingsley for our patreon review for october and this is about fiona and evan 
Evan is a Bailey brother. This is a Grump Sunshine pairing and this heroine, Fiona, she is my girl crush. I love her so much. She's so sunshiny, but she's also really badass. She's very voluptuous. She knows cars because she's worked for her dad and she knows all about like restoring cars and stuff and that's how her and Evan start to connect because he restores cars. She's tattooed and she loves plants. She also has a way with animals. Like she's just so freaking cool. I love her so much. I love the Bailey brothers. Claire Kingsley is really skilled at making small town romance extremely interesting. And it's just, it's beautiful. If you haven't read this series, you totally should. The first two books are a duet. So it's the same couple and it's a lot more angsty than the rest of the books in the series, I will say. All right, that is it. That's my wrap up for the last two weeks in October. And I'm cutting off um, October here. So even though I technically have like two more days, I have to date, which is the 30th and tomorrow Halloween to continue reading. I'm just going to start November basically. So I will be doing a complete and total October wrap up. So we'll talk about like my favorite books, my least favorite books and stuff like that, where I stand with keeping up with my TBR, <laughs> which will be interesting to see because I had kind of like a crazy October TBR but I had fun. I had a lot of fun. Very many highs, very many lows. If you like this video, go to big thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe to get notified in any future videos that I do. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, life's better with little HEA. Bye guys.